uh, to the third speaker in our uh, series, spring series. As you know, this is actually a um, collaborative uh, project with the uh, Heinz College. And so we're just very delighted uh, to have this opportunity to uh, sponsor a series where the two of us um, are interacting on a pretty regular basis. So Krishnan, the Dean of the college is here. I'd like him to say a few words about our collaboration and then we'll get started. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. And uh, good evening to everybody. Um, as uh, Professor Trotter just mentioned, I think this is uh, uh, one really uh, substantive and excellent example of the continuing collaboration between CAUSE and, uh, and the Heinz College around uh, a set of really important issues related to um, racial disparities and health. Uh, and today's speaker, and Professor Trotter is gonna introduce Dr. Scott in just a minute. We're just absolutely delighted to be able to host these series and in particular our speaker today. So uh, I just wanna thank um, 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 Professor Trotter for his leadership and you know my colleagues on um, both sides, both in history and at Heinz, uh, who've been instrumental in uh, organizing and coordinating and uh, putting together this program. So let me turn this uh, back to you, Joe, and thank you okay. again for this collaboration. Okay, well, uh, Krishna, I actually want to thank the Heinz College. Uh, this is an extraordinary opportunity for us. Uh, so we very much appreciate this. Uh, look, today is a special day because we have our own postdoctoral fellow, uh, Aisha Scott, delivering uh, the cause lecture. Uh, and now Aisha has um, given talks in our classrooms, in our different uh, forums over the years. So she now feels probably overworked by us, even though she's supposed to be on a, a leave from all of that work so that she can work on her book. But she's been a delightful addition to our staff and our activities. And so I'm just happy uh, to be able to introduce her today. Um, look, I also want to just thank our audience. Um, you are amazing. Uh, Friday evenings is our real slot and people show up and we're just so happy uh, that this is working out for people to take time out of their schedule uh, to be with us. Uh, I don't want to delay too long uh, our introduction of Aisha, but I do want to acknowledge that this series gets a lot of help. Uh, from our department head, Nico Slate, from our Dean, Richard Shines, the Provost, Jim Garrett, and the President, um, Johanian. Um, and so, you know, we just feel fortunate. Uh, we've been doing this about 25 years now. <laughs> and so we just uh, appreciate how you as an audience have showed, showed up at these events. So without further delay, I want to just go ahead and uh, um, introduce uh, our speaker. Um, but just one more thank you. Um, okay, Eva Jean and Sri, thanks very much for being extraordinary administrative support uh, for us and helping us to stay on track uh, with this series. So with that, I would like to turn to uh, Aisha, uh, Scott. Um, Aisha is our postdoctoral fellow, as I mentioned, but I want to congratulate her too, because she has now become an assistant professor at Providence College in the health and policy management uh, program. So we just want to extend a hearty congratulations uh, to, to Aisha. Um, she received her PhD degree uh, from Stony Brook uh, University in public policy. Um, actually in 20th century US history, she received her MA degree in public policy from Stony Brook as well. Uh, she is a firm advocate uh, for social justice and closing the gap in healthcare for underrepresented communities. And she's been doing this in such an effective way that in 2017, she received Stony Brook Center for Inclusive Education Scholar Award for Excellence. 
And then two years later, she received Stony Brook's Alumni Life Member Award. So we want to applaud uh, her uh, accolades. But Professor Scott specializes in public health and African-American history. She has also taught specialized courses on AIDS, race, and gender in the Black community. She also teaches courses on the evolution of Black politics. And this year, as a cause postdoctoral fellow, she is hard at work on her book entitled Respectability Can't Save You, The AIDS Epidemic in Black America. And so today she's going to give us a treat, uh, pulling from that study and talk about the AIDS epidemic in Black America foreshadowing the health disparities of COVID-19. So please join me in welcoming Aisha Scott as our third speaker. And a virtual hands clap. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Charter, thank you so much for the warm welcome. And thank you to everyone for coming out and taking the time to join this conversation on a Friday afternoon. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to you all today about respectability politics, the HIV AIDS epidemic in Black America, and its implications on racial health disparities regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I would like to begin with a brief overview of the state of the AIDS epidemic in Black America. So I'm going to get ready to screen share with you. Just give me one second. All right. So when people think about the AIDS epidemic in Black America, um, they tend to, well, when they think about the AIDS epidemic generally, they think about initially, at least in the 1980s, a, a disease that primarily impacted gay white men. And they think about the browning of the epidemic as something that happened in the early 90s. And there's a reason for that, because we see a shift in 1993 with the Centers for Disease Control and Surveillance. They included um, the ways in which black, the, the different sorts of, sorts of symptoms and, and the ways that HIV and AIDS presents in women and also black and brown communities in their surveillance data. So we see a massive spike in the early 90s of cases of HIV and AIDS in black America. But in fact, that's not the first time that we see the disproportionate impact. There was always a disproportionate impact of HIV and AIDS in Black America. When we hear about the, the onset of HIV, you always hear about the first three cases and how it, they were gay white men. But no one talks about the next three cases that were all Black people. Um, and what we do see is that by 1987, African Americans already accounted for one in four persons living with AIDS. By the time we get to the early 90s, African-Americans accounted for nearly a third of people living with AIDS. And by the mid 90s, African-Americans accounted for 44.9, which is basically almost half of persons leading with AIDS diagnosis. So this was not an epidemic that just browned, that transitioned overnight and browned. What we saw was a transition, an overnight transition in surveillance of the disease and of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And this is something that we'll see come up again in the early conversations about COVID um, when there was this um, sort of myth that was circling around that Black people couldn't catch COVID in the early days and that it was just a disease that wasn't really impacting the Black community in the early weeks of COVID, which was very quickly discounted when we saw how infection rates began to spike in Black and Brown communities. So when a devastating epidemic, sexually transited, transmitted, deadly, but initially associated with gay, mostly white men, began to spread disproportionately among African Americans in the late 20th century, many state and Black community leaders avoided acknowledging the scourge in their midst for as long as possible. The reticence on the part of that leadership, both at the community and state level, not only exacerbated the spread of medical misinformation, but also shaped the public health policies toward the epidemic. Similarly, the current COVID-19 pandemic has also been plagued by reticent responses from state leaders that led to deadly misinformation and disproportionate loss of life among African-Americans. Quote, 
Incidents, hospitalization rates, and mortality were highest among Black, African American, and Hispanic Latino persons, as well as those who were living in neighborhoods with high poverty, end quote. This is from a COVID-19 CDC report, but strikingly similar language can be found in HIV AIDS CDC reports as well from the 1980s up until as recently as 2018. In 2018, African Americans and Latinx persons respectively accounted for approximately 42% and 27% of new HIV infections, combining for almost 70% of new infections. As of March 7th of 2021, Black people were most likely to die from COVID-19, with accounting for 15% of deaths. Currently, as uh, Dr. Trotter mentioned, I'm working on my book manuscript, Respectability Can't Save You, The AIDS Epidemic in Urban Black America, which focuses on the impact of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the African American community and the role of respectability politics or moral policing on its leadership during this period. In particular, my work addresses how several forces shape the national, local, and community responses, or lack thereof, toward the African American HIV AIDS epidemic, especially in New York City. My research uses New York City as a case study because it has historically been one of the most impacted regions by HIV AIDS since the inception of the epidemic in the early 1980s. Additionally, New York City was often at the forefront of policy change to increase access to care for those living with the disease. These forces include the influence of the Black church, the impact of respectability politics from federal and local government, class dynamics, and gender relations. These forces have also played pivotal roles in responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on Black and Latinx communities that I will discuss today. Unfortunately, New York City was also an early epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, making it a very suitable point of comparison of the responses to the two public health crises. Today, I will take you through my examination of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the African American community and the incredible parallels to the current COVID-19 pandemic due to their shared root causes in terms of systemic socioeconomic disparities. In excavating how the aforementioned, profoundly, the aforementioned forces profoundly shaped the HIV AIDS epidemic among African Americans, I tell the story of a community silently ravaged by the epidemic Unraveling these forces also illuminated how white supremacy pushed back on the legislative successes of the civil rights movement through racially coded policy reform to preserve its autonomy. Through an exploration of HIV AIDS, I argue that the history of African-American public health has largely been shaped by the imposition of and resistance to respectability politics of the state. HIV AIDS, is a vehicle, a placeholder of sorts, for understanding the ways in which respectability politics have been used to systemically racialize socioeconomic disparities that inherently leave the African-American community vulnerable. A vulnerability that is being highlighted again today with COVID-19. I argue that this vulnerability by intentional avoidance of systemic root causes, access to affordable housing, employment, quality education, and healthcare, is purposeful and historical, justified through racialized manipulations of respectability. Refusal to treat poverty as a trigger for the HIV AIDS epidemic in the African American community is a contemporary manifestation of medical racism at best and genocide at worst. The impact of this willful avoidance is clearly evidenced in the current COVID-19 pandemic, where the CDC literally cited affordable housing, employment, income gaps and quality healthcare and education as the foremost reasons for the disproportionate COVID infections and deaths in Black and Latinx communities. Building on the work of, of African-American public health scholars like Alondra Nelson and Samuel Roberts, my research uses HIV AIDS as a case study to make three important historiographical interventions that have larger implications for our historical understanding of respectability politics and generally African-American public health. There we go. Um, first, by applying critical race theory, it reveals how respectability politics impacted health outcomes by influencing the decisions of leaders both inside and outside of the African-American community. Second, it reconsiders the long-term impact of the civil rights movement. 
by examining how white supremacy prevented the legislative successes of the 1960s from achieving full racial equality, a failure which left African-Americans perpetually vulnerable to health disparities. Third, it not only expands, but reconfigures the definition of respectability politics. Typically, the term has been defined as a problematic tool of resistance that is passively complicit with white supremacy. But this work examines respectability politics as an active weapon of oppression. Additionally, my work draws on emerging carceral state literature to highlight the many intersections between mass incarceration and public health policy toward the African American HIV AIDS epidemic. The American public health community has long recognized the connections between systemic poverty and disproportionate HIV AIDS infection rates in disenfranchised communities. The Centers for Disease Control asserts that African Americans experienced disproportionate poverty and the socioeconomic issues associated with poverty, including limited access to high quality health care, housing, and HIV prevention education, directly and indirectly increase their risk for HIV infection. While this work supports the recognition of disproportionate poverty in African American communities and its overlap with the disproportionate infection rates, that is not its purpose. Rather, this work explores how the systemic socioeconomic disparities in the African American community are intentional through, man through manipulations of respectability politics for the maintenance of white supremacy, subsequently leaving the community vulnerable to health disparities. The reasons I employed New York City as my case study for local government and community responses to the epidemic in the African American community were numerous. First, New York City has and continues to be disproportionately impacted by the HIV AIDS epidemic, both generally and among marginalized populations since its onset in the, 19, in the early 1980s, which is especially important today in our conversation and looking at COVID-19 because it's also showing us how COVID plays out amongst marginalized populations and within spaces that have a very diverse group in terms of socioeconomic status. So I began this work by providing historical context for how respectability politics have been historically weaponized by the state to continually construct and redefine blackness in ways that preserve the economic status of white supremacy. I accomplished this objective by examining key shifts in conceptions of racial respectability from the colonial era through the 1950s in the United States. These turning points include the initial justification of African enslavement in the American colonies as a means for converting heathens to Christians, the 1664 Maryland law that declared baptism did not necessitate, necessitate manumission, the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705, the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, and the Compromise of 1877 that effectively ended Reconstruction and the subsequent institutionalization of racial disparities during the Jim Crow era. By examining these key moments, I explored how the medicalization of blackness was continuously used to substantiate shifts in respectability through clinical declarations of racial difference and inferiority prior to the civil rights movement. These clinical and scientific de declarations of racial difference legitimized respectability politics, thereby solidifying its influence on constructions of blackness in America. Often the black church in its diversity of expressions found itself at the helm of navigating respectability politics on behalf of the African-American community during these shifts, either through its own deployment for racial uplift or as resistance to oppressive forces. Also the importance of religion of black, uh, to black American health can be traced back to multiple spiritual beliefs of different African tribes. In order to truly examine the inner workings of respectability politics as it relates to black health, we need a historical context of the centrality of the black church. This work illuminates how top-down perspective respectability politics were used by elites and the state to police African-American bodies and impede racial progress from the colonial era to, through, to, through the 1950s. Additionally, it contends that these earlier shifts in respectability laid the foundation for those of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s that left African Americans at the center of the HIV AIDS crisis then and the current COVID-19 crisis now. The manipulation of respectability politics and Black health with respect to COVID-19 is most clearly exemplified in the discussion of vaccine hesitancy. 
there has been much conversation about vaccine hesitancy among Black people in the United States because of the longstanding distrust between the community and medical professionals for both historical and continuous neglect and experimentation due to systemic racism. Classic examples of this legacy date back to slavery with Dr. Marion Sims experimenting gynecological procedures on enslaved Black women, the Tuskegee experiment from the 1930s where nearly 400 Black men with syphilis were lied to and denied proper treatment for 40 years, the harvesting of the famous HeLa cells used to create the polio vaccine from Henrietta Lacks without her family's consent. But historical memory is not the only source of this distrust. The current lived experiences of Black people with medical pro professionals inform the current state of relations with the Black community. Currently, Black women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth than their white counterparts. And the mortality rates of Black babies are cut in half when the doctor of record is also Black. Pregnant Black women often find their voices, pains, and concerns ignored by medical providers. Even tennis superstar Serena Williams found her voice ignored in a near-death experience following a C-section with her daughter, Alexis Olympia. Due to a history of pulmonary embolisms, she warned a nurse of her symptoms and insisted that she needed a, a CT scan. The nurse initially ignored her claims, but Williams continued to advocate for herself until a doctor ran the scan, where he found several blood clots settled in her lungs. Williams' story shows that notoriety, income, and gold star health insurance does not save Black women from implicit bias and structural racism. I argue that the warranted distrust of medical professionals in the Black community is being exploited to create a myopic narrative that suggests that most Black people do not want to be vaccinated and lack understanding of what the vaccine would mean for protecting themselves and their loved ones. However, recent data from the Pew Research Center speaks to the contrary telling us that Black adults in the U.S. across the board have heightened concerns regarding COVID-19 compared to the rest of the population, with 94% wearing masks in public spaces. Uh -oh. In fact, 61% of Black adults surveyed said they will get vaccinated, which lags the national average by only 8%. Nonetheless, we have seen consistent reports that vaccinations in Black and Latinx communities across the country are significantly lagging their white counterparts. While vaccine hesitancy surely accounts for a fraction of this disparity, it is also being used as a scapegoat to avoid the more pertinent and costly task of tackling socioeconomic inequalities. Pediatrician and public health advocate, Dr. Rhea Boyd, penned a New York Times article entitled, Black People Need Better Vaccine Access, Not Better Vaccine Attitudes, and gave an interview where she highlighted unequal access to broadband internet, phone service, regular health providers, health insurance, and resident proximate pharmacies as being at the root of low vaccination rates in Black communities. Vaccine hesitancy provides a public narrative that pathologizes Black people as responsible for being disproportionately under-vaccinated as opposed to highlighting the systemic gaps that prevent equal access to the vaccine. Dr. Oni Blackstock, the former assistant commissioner for the New York City Department of, of Health Bureau of HIV and physician in the predominantly Black community of Harlem, stated, using vaccine hesitant to refer to people who have not been given the, informa the information they need to make an important decision is a horrible misnomer. All my patients today were hesitant when I brought up the COVID-19 vaccine. But after I answered their questions, they were like, I want it. White supremacy often manifests itself in healthcare through blame and erasure by framing marginalized communities as responsible for not using resources while ignoring that they do not have access to them. Black churches are being tapped as essential resources to bridge gaps in access to COVID testing, healthcare, and vaccinations in Black communities across the United States. As I will discuss regarding the role of the Black church in HIV AIDS, mobilization of the Black community largely centers on the response of the Black church leadership. <clears throat> COVID and HIV AIDS have generated vastly different responses from Black church leaders due to the respectability politics around modes of transmission. COVID has become what scholar Kathy Cohen would describe as a consensus issue, 
an issue that elicits a community-wide response because of a linked fate for the entire community versus HIV AIDS, which was stereotyped as a vector of sexual deviance. Black church organizations, including the National Black Church Initiative, NBCI, and the Conference of National Black Churches have stepped up in a major way to engage a coordinated effort to educate the Black community about the vaccine and provide the people access to get one. MBCI is a, co a coalition of over 150,000 African-American churches, is working with Latinx community partners, including the National Hispanic Medical Association, on a $150 million plan to vaccinate over 106 million Black and Latinx congregants across the country. The plan that has already secured 3,500 Black and Latinx doctors will need 2.5 million volunteers to execute and will be the largest faith-based mobilization of African-American and Latino Protestant denominations in the country to achieve a single health goal. Reverend Anthony Evans, the president of MBCI, said he hopes to meet with the Biden administration administration within the next 90 days, stating, Mr. President, we helped you. It is time for you to provide the resources for our community to help us. Now, as many of you may or may not know, whenever election season comes around, all the politicians put together their campaign pitches and they circulate the Black churches. And they, they make their, their pitch to as to why the members of that community need to support them. And what we see Reverend Evans doing here is saying, listen, we showed up for you in November. And now it's time for you to show up for us and make sure that the people in our community get the access to the resources that they need to survive this pandemic. The Conference of National Black Churches represents 80% of Black American Christians, which is about 30,000 congregants. They have secured a $7.5 million CDC grant um, so that they can implement a program called REV, Reach, Educate, Vaccinate. The program targets 20 cities that has pharmacy deserts and will create convenient vaccination locations. We see the important work of the Black church playing out in Black and Latinx communities across the country. An older Black woman at First Baptist Church in Queens, New York said, she felt great about receiving the vaccine and coming to a place that she knew because it felt safe, like home. My manuscript examines the complexities of the Black church and health activism. It explores the Black church as both a victim and perpetrator of respectability politics as a tool of oppression over time and the impact it had on the HIV AIDS epidemic. As the longest standing institution in the African-American community, often the central space for organizing, the Black church played critically important roles in the, in the formation of African-American identity. Often criticized by HIV AIDS advocates for their early silence on the epidemic in the African-American community, the Black church was far from silent during the 1980s. However, their battle cries most certainly reflected the national political agenda of the day. The president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, was hard on drugs and silent on HIV AIDS. In many ways, Black church advocacy reflected this image, a product of the nation's respectability politics. The negative impact of, of Black church leadership silence on the epidemic is without question, as it muted the voices of the afflicted in the community through erasure. Reverend Irene Monroe stated, we Black clergy knew that HIV AIDS was killing African Americans before the CDC, because they were coming to us first. We were visiting them at home and in the hospitals when they were sick and dying. We were the ones performing the funerals. Through an analysis of the complex relations between Black church leaders at the local and national levels, I examined their stark difference in perceptions of respectability politics in the 1980s and its subsequent impact on responses to the HIV AIDS epidemic. In the absence of HIV AIDS advocacy for the community from the Black church leaders, there was a rise in grassroots activism via nonprofit organizations like Gay Men of Af African Descent, more commonly referred to as GMAD, the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, and Bomb and Gilead in the late 80s and 90s to combat this epidemic. Each made efforts to bridge the gap between the church and the community regarding HIV AIDS. GMAD appealed to the community to see them as their brothers and sons and recognize that homophobia was yet another manifestation of white supremacy 
Balm and Gilead in particular functioned to provide clergy with the language they needed to help those living with the illness. They literally created um, a curriculum to teach clergy how to engage those living with HIV AIDS. And while the efforts of grassroots organizations made strides in bringing black church leaders into the fight against AIDS, there were still figures like Pastor Jordan. Okay, hold on. Like Pastor Jordan, pictured here, who felt AIDS was God's curse on homosexuality. This work does not seek to excuse the silence and slow response of black church leaders to the epidemic but it does contextualize the response within the complex respectability politics of the black community in the 1980s. Similar to the HIV AIDS epidemic, grassroots organizations have been a critical component to combating COVID-19 in black and Latinx communities. Many of the same organizations who built community frameworks that provided the most marginalized of these communities with the, with the resources they needed to combat HIV AIDS are currently bridging the gap for COVID-19. The National Black Leadership Commission on Health, formerly known as the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, partnered with New York City Health and Hospitals to create test and trace programs in Black communities with zip codes reporting the highest rates of infection. Between July and November 2020, Black Health leveraged their relationships to host over 600 events, connecting over 100,000 New Yorkers in high-risk communities and distributed over half a million masks along with resources for COVID-19. The president of the National Latino Commission on AIDS and founder of the Hispanic Health Network, Guillermo Chacon, has been tapped by New York Governor Cuomo to serve on the COVID-19 Vaccine Equity Task Force. Chacon is joined by 19 other leaders of nonprofit, faith-based and or community-based organizations that focus on shrinking inequities in communities of color. As Dr. Rhea Boyd discussed the misnomer of vaccine hesitancy in her interview, she also mentioned that when vaccination sites with appointments that don't require internet access are created within Black communities, the people show up. This is evidenced by the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium in Philadelphia that created a mobile testing and vaccination unit and allows people to come as walk-in appointments on a first-come, first-served basis. The consortium outpaced the city's average of 3,500 vaccinations a day by vaccinating 4,000 residents during the first 24 hour walk up site. Even more remarkable is that three out of four Philadelphians vaccinated at the city's first round the clock walk up site were people of color, a particularly notable number in a city where 55% of the people who were vaccinated were white, although they only accounted for 40% of the residents. We can see this model is spreading across the country with the governor of Ohio setting a control group of walk-up vaccination sites in underserved communities of Cleveland. And also clinics are popping up, walking clinics are popping, popping up in California and Florida as well. The next section, trickle down respectability politics in HIV AIDS in black America, explores how definitions of respectability were shifted by the state in the 1960s, 70s and 80s for the maintenance of white supremacy and how this respectability was specifically weaponized to keep the status quo following the civil rights movement. Using President Lyndon Johnson's administration as a starting point, I chronicle how the state's manipulation of black respectability and subsequent criminalization of blackness increased African-American vulnerability to HIV AIDS through the Ronald Reagan administration. The civil rights movement was ideally supposed to serve as a bridge to equity along the American color line by doing more than simply quelling the rampant violence and inhumane treatment of African Americans. However, gaping disparities in employment, education, housing, and health care persisted from the 1960s to the present. I argue that the socioeconomic deficiencies that persisted in spite of the civil rights movement and Black power movement were intentional and systemically meant to leave African Americans vulnerable. The 1980s brought the twin crises of HIV AIDS and mass incarceration to a community ripe with susceptibility. More broadly, I argue that blatant manipulations of respectability politics by state actors, either through demonization or erasure of undesirable groups, demonstrates that white supremacy adapts to eliminate any threat to its sustenance. This section considers how respectability politics was weaponized by the state against African Americans to allow socioeconomic and health disparities to continue after the corrective legislation of the civil rights movement 
through the Clinton administration of the 1990s. Using New York City as a case study, I also analyzed the consequences of weaponized respectability politics on African Americans at the level of local governments handling of the HIV AIDS epidemic. It examines the responses of the, of the respective New York City mayoral administrations to the aforementioned presidential administration's approaches to the HIV AIDS epidemic. I examine the impact of federal respectability politics on local government. Excavating the voices of people living with AIDS in New York City, like Ty Fortner, a formerly homeless sex worker who purposely sabotaged his health with HIV to qualify for government funded AIDS housing. Ty Fortner, his story is particularly um, heart wrenching and telling because this is a young man that found himself at the age of 16, living on the street, homeless, and using sex work to survive. And by the time he turned 22, he received his HIV diagnosis, and he found out that he found out about New York City's HASA program, which basically provides housing assistance to those who are living with AIDS. So while he's still living on the street, trying to manage care with HIV, he figured that his best bet was to sacrifice his health so that he could get access to housing and then have a permanent safe place to live. So he stopped taking his medication and over the course of months, his health deteriorated. He at one point ends up in a nursing home with blood clots in his legs. But at the age of 28, he received his AIDS diagnosis and the first keys to, an, to his own apartment that he'd had in his adult life. And I've used this to, this to exemplify the impact of respectability politics on the AIDS epidemic. You know, former associate manager and social worker for the AIDS Service Center of New York City, Kiani McCoo stated that the access that people of color have to healthcare in New York City is amazing. The dedicated HIV AIDS clinics where patients can get quality care from amazing experienced and compassionate doctors is a great model. Is it perfect? No, but it's the best in the US. McCool stated that housing is the most glaring flaw in the New York City AIDS model. And we can see from Ty Fortner's story that that is, that is the case, that this is the, the, the problem is not necessarily getting people to, to a doctor in New York, but once you connect them to care, it's hard for them to stay in care if they don't have other stable factors in their, in their lives. And this is also clearly exemplified through these first two, two charts on the left. When we look at the poverty levels in New York City versus the HIV diagnosis rates for that same time frame, as you can see, these are charts that could literally be laid over one another. Now we can also take a look at, sorry, I have to move, move around the, the Zoom thing so I can see the charts myself. Um, but now let's take a look at the same the same side-by-side -side data for New York City poverty rates and COVID-19 infections. And we can see that the systemic poverty and poor health outcome um, correlations are devastatingly stark. What we are looking at here are barriers to care, a charted reflection of working class communities with jobs that didn't allow them to work from home, multi-generational households, limited access to health quality health care, heavy reliance on public transportation, underperforming schools, and housing insecurity. Presidential and federal government responses to public health emergencies in the United States of America set the tone for how well the country will bold in, bold in successfully combating it. We now know that from a leaked interview that by at least February 7th, Donald Trump knew that COVID was airborne and described it as, that's a very tricky one. That's a very delicate one. It's also more deadly than even your strenuous flus. But publicly in late February, he said, it's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. By late March, then President Donald Trump branded himself as a wartime president in the early stages of the pandemic, but immediately followed by delegating all responsibility for COVID response to state leaders. He told New York's Governor Cuomo in April at the height of its state of emergency that the federal government is merely a backup to state government. Decentralizing authority in the middle of a national crisis is unprecedented. The lack of a national strategic plan and guidance caused governors to form regional alliances to coordinate response to COVID and plans to safely reopen. These alliances were viewed as opposition to the White House. 
The concepts of masks and social distancing and vaccines were turned into political footballs instead of public health measures. Trump's refusal to comply with regular mask wearing and blasting of states who were not ready to safely reopen emboldened resistance to these measures on the ground, putting Americans at greater risk. There is another disproportionate impact that the COVID pandemic has resulted in, and that is women leaving the workforce at faster paces than men and returning slower. The HIV AIDS epidemic in Black America also had a gender dynamic. My research uses gender to explore the intersectional impact and relationship between white supremacy and respectability politics with regard to its impact on the HIV AIDS epidemic in the Black community from the 1980s to 2010. The demonization of gay white men and erasure of white women from the HIV AIDS epidemic evidence that white supremacy does not distribute its privilege equally. There's one particular article um, that was written in Cosmo magazine in January of 1988. And the reason why that time frame is important is because by 1988, we have a pretty firm grip on how HIV is transmitted, how it's not transmitted. There's been, um, uh, the Surgeon General has sent has circulated information to all the homes in the United States about how people can protect themselves and what they need to do in order to um, be proactive in regards to HIV and AIDS. But this was an article written by a psychiatrist um, and it was called Reassuring News About AIDS, A Doctor Tells You Why You May Not Be at Risk. And it was written by Dr. Robert Gold. And one of the things that's really important about this is that he says this is words from a doctor, right? In 1988, Google was not what we use it for today. So if you see it's words from a doctor, most people are assuming that this is a physician that has the, the specialty to offer the expertise that he is claiming to share. So he goes on to basically tell women that as long as they're engaging in missionary sexual intercourse, then they are safe. They will not contract HIV. But if they're doing other things, that's how you put yourself at risk. And when he received pushback and people said, well, we have documented cases in Africa of heterosexual transmission of HIV. His response was, well, it's, it's come to my attention that you know African men take their women in a very brutal way that's tantamount to rape. So that's why they're able to transmit um, HIV and through heterosexual um, intercourse. So, we see him double down using these stereotypes of hypersexuality of blackness um, to per perpetuate this idea that somehow sexual conservatism could, um, in terms of, of, of your practices pro would protect you from contracting HIV. And what this really does is we think about who the readership is for Cosmo Ma Magazine, which was largely white women, especially in the late 1980s, there was an erasure of white women from this epidemic with this article. So through, and then we see this happen again within the black community. So through a juxtaposition of an interview I conducted with HIV AIDS advocate, Russell Miller Hill, and a, form, a formerly incarcerated African-American woman living with AIDS, and the life of renowned AIDS activist and survivor Ray Lewis Thornton, I examined the impact of internal gendered respectability politics in the Black community. These internal respectability politics put an educated, middle-class, sexually conservative Thornton as the face of Black women in the epidemic, while erasing the experiences of poor Black women and those combating addiction like Miller Hill. Moreover, I contextualized the role of the state and elites in shaping their experiences. The section also examines how respectability politics painted black women as victims of duplicitous bisexual black men to protect their respectability at the expense of their sexual autonomy. As Miller Hill takes me through her personal journey with HIV AIDS as not only a prisoner in New York, but also as a mother, wife and advocate, I include the relevant policy changes and political agendas that shaped her experiences on the local and national level. This work goes beyond the orthodox depiction of black women as bystanders in the phenomenon of mass incarceration in the African-American community. It examines their experiences as subjects of the carceral state, as opposed to wives, girlfriends, and mothers of incarcerated black men. 
regarding African-American masculinity, I consulted multiple archival sources, as I mentioned earlier, the Gay Men of African Descent Organization, along with an interview with Angelo Pinto, formerly with the Arthur Ashe Urban in um, Institute of Urban Health. Um, Pinto had conducted these um, barbershop talks with a physician from SUNY's downstate um, to figure out the African-American male perspectives on sex, sexuality, and HIV in New York City neighborhoods with high HIV prevalence rates. I explore the impact of toxic conceptions of and stereotypes of African American masculinity as hypersexual and homophobic in combating the community's AIDS epidemic. When I wrote the epilogue of the dissertation version of this pro project while I was still in graduate school, I had a sentence that read, ultimately, a cure for HIV AIDS could be found tomorrow, and a new disease would emerge wreaking the same havoc on the African-American community because the structural racism that prevents access to necessary resources have not been addressed. Little did I know that disease was less than a year away with the onset of COVID-19 disproportionately impacting black and brown communities. As long as respectability politics are weaponized by politicians pandering to white conservative and Christian values while wielding stereotypes about criminality, hypersexuality, and laziness regarding racial minorities, government policies will continue to reflect bias and promote disparities across lines of housing, employment, and ultimately health. Scholar Ibram Kendi spoke to this sentiment stating, any politician pledging to keep us safe who is drastically overfunding law and order, border security and wars on terror and drastically underfunding medical research, prevention and healthcare is a politician pledging to, to keep our bodies unsafe. My manuscript's current epilogue entitled Black Lives Matter and HIV AIDS, Where Are We Now? examines the current state of the HIV AIDS epidemic in the African-American community. It's parallels with the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the contentious role of respectability politics from President Bush, George W. Bush's administration to Donald Trump's administration. It addresses the major pushback against intersectional forms of respectability politics during President Barack Obama's administration through massive legislative healthcare changes and the resurgence of social justice grassroots activism in the African-American community, a movement triggered by the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012. Specifically, it examines how the 2010 enactment of the Affordable Care Act, the largest health care legislation since the advent of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, made strides to close racial and economic gaps in access to care. In addition, I analyzed how the 2016 presidential election of Donald Trump was part of a larger visceral backlash to the progressive legislative changes and social justice protests of the Obama era that threatened to shrink equity gaps for underrepresented groups. Like the criminalization of blackness under the Nixon and Reagan administrations, the Trump administration characterized Mexican immigrants as rapists and criminals and Black Lives Matter protesters as anti-American. This work investigates how Trump and his administration use xenophobic and racially coded language to manipulate definitions of respectability to marginalize dis disenfranchised groups specifically for the maintenance of white supremacy and the impact these actions have had on the HIV AIDS epidemic. The Trump campaign capitalized on a distressed white working class vowing to make America great again by promising to undo Obama era advancements in healthcare, criminal justice, housing, and tax reform. The success of Trump's campaign provides a contemporary example for the paradox of respectability. When white supremacy is threatened, the, de the definition of what is respectable will adjust to protect it. Consistent with the rest of my work, um, I use New York as the case study. And you know, locally, New York Governor Cuomo, he instituted an end AIDS campaign, into, um, end AIDS 2020 campaign. And the goal was to reduce um, the maximum number of new infections to 750 per year. And I spend time like exploring the feasibility of this of this campaign. We don't really know whether or not it was completely successful yet because the 2020 numbers have not been um, submitted, but I have some doubts about how valid those numbers will be anyway, because we know that no one was going to the hospital or the doctor last year unless they were 
having COVID symptoms or they were really um, very, very sick. So a lot of people stayed home when maybe they even should have went to a doctor in 2020. So I'm not too sure how accurate those numbers will be. However, um, Governor Cuomo believes that New York City has bent the curve with HIV AIDS because there was a 30% reduction in new yearly cases from the beginning of the campaign in 2014. And one notable element is that the viral suppression, which is reduced, which is evidenced here, um, the viral suppression rate is 77% of HIV in, of cases in New York State, which really shows it speaks to um, what social worker McCoo's point earlier point was that New York does a great job of connecting those living with HIV to care. My work uses HIV AIDS to exemplify the effects of a failed realization of the American racial equality promised by the legislative successes of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Since 2013, the American people have lived in a time that mirrors the racial dynamics of the late 1960s in the United States. In urban cities, the rate of unemployment for African Americans is at least double that of their white counterparts. The schools in African American communities overwhelmingly perform poorer than that of their white counterparts and access to affordable housing is increasingly limited. The COVID pandemic has only exacerbated these problems. Incidents of police brutality against African Americans are splashing across newspapers and television screens at, at almost a monthly rate. While there are promising campaigns to end the AIDS epidemic, African Americans still account for nearly half of all new infections. And while this is a, a, a more, while mortality rates are changing daily, um, recently African Americans led mortality rates in the COVID-19 pandemic. The question remains, where are we now? And the answer to this point is inconclusive, as it appears that we are in the midst of a new civil rights movement featuring the Me Too movement, gay rights advocacy, and Black Lives Matter. White supremacy has been successful to this point because of its umbrella effect. While it only protects and serves straight, wealthy, cisgendered white men the most, it offers some protections to white people and wealthy ra racial minorities that do not fit this mold. This was exemplified in my gender section when gay white men who had, all but, who had been all but forgotten by the government in the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic went on to exclude advocates of color as the epidemic browned and they secured their own funding. So the real question becomes, have we reached a point where each marginalized group across lines of race, class and gender can appreciate that in order for true equality to, to be achieved in any of these areas, it must be achieved in all of them. In order to prevent the next epidemic from presenting in this same manner as COVID-19 has evidenced, structures that protect white supremacy must be dismantled. So thank you so much for listening and I will see the floor back to Dr. Trotter. Okay, um, thank you very much um, Aisha for that extraordinary talk. Um, raises it raises a lot of questions, and I know you're going to get some. Uh, so we're going to ask Evie, uh, Jean, uh, to monitor this um, feature where you can write in your questions, um, and we will uh, um, uh, have Evie recite those, and Aisha can provide some responses. So thanks a lot, and uh, please. Um, you may begin uh, raising your questions. I, I think I will raise a question for Aisha while you collect your thoughts. Um, Aisha, on this question of activism, um, I'm wondering if, um, you see the potential for activism as being greater under the impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, than under the, um, the impact of AIDS, you know, during the 19, you know, late 70s, 1980s. Uh, are there certain- Healthcare activism or more broadly um, social justice activism? Well, I'm, I'm thinking of grassroots kinds of activism Mm -hmm. um, that has to do with trying to counteract some of what has been uh, documented as uh, racial disparities 
in the contraction and death uh, from the disease? I do think that there will be more room for activism around uh, COVID than it was for HIV AIDS. One, because just the nature of the disease, there was just so much that so quickly that it wasn't, there wasn't this ability to go years before recognizing that the surveillance is off. You know, this was a matter of weeks before people were like, okay, wait, black and brown communities are being disproportionately impacted. Okay, black and brown communities are not being vaccinated at the same rate as other, as, as their white counterparts. We need to do something to fix this. And I think because helping black and brown people be able to stay well with COVID helps everyone else stay well. It's, there's like a, there's self-preservation that's involved in this. So I do think that there's going to be more support um, that will be available for people who are trying to do this work. And I think you're seeing this, which is why people who run organizations like National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, National Latino Commission on AIDS are being tapped to try and help with COVID outreach because they know that they are the ones who built these networks that can reach the most marginalized of these communities. And that's why the government officials also know that these are the people who can help get to these communities right now. Okay. Um, look, I'm gonna just ask our technical person a question. Uh, you know, we can't see um, Aisha at all. Is there a way uh, to introduce her into the frame? I'm, I'm oh, seeing her, might be your settings in your in your zoom because i'm i'm seeing Professor Carr, we can we can see her mm -hmm. i have a question from karen gibson uh can mrs scott elaborate on her definition of of respectability politics how is the application of the concept different or similar between aids and covid sure so respectability politics so traditionally, um, respectability politics is talked about as like a tool of resistance. And it was, this was a term that was coined by Evelyn Hagen Botham in her work, Righteous Discontent, to talk about black race women um, during the great migration using assimilation tactics to um, try and prove that black people were just as worthy as their white counterparts by showing that they could act in the same ways as um, through through those sorts of assimilation tactics. But um, the way that I've redefined it is that it's not just this problematic tool of resistance, right? Because what I didn't get to talk about is how it's, it can be weaponized. And I don't use um, race necessarily within um, the term of respectability politics because it can be used within marginalized groups. And it's about power. Like we can see how Martin Luther King, right? Like we, we think about him in the civil rights movement. We think about him as this icon and we think about how he used respectability politics by the way he came dressed in full suit to protest and to show like, you know, like we are civilized and, and we're not gonna gain, uh, engage in violent behavior. But then we, we find out about things, instances where Adam Clayton Powell threatened to expose or not to expose, but to accuse MLK of being in a romantic relationship with Bayard Rustin if they went through with a protest that he didn't approve of. So he then weaponized the, the concept because he knew of the homophobia that existed within the Black community and the larger American community, and that would ruin MLK's credibility. So he knew that he could weaponize um, respectability in that way to control his actions. And this is why Bayard Rustin ends up leaving um, MLK's camp and after being super influential for the March on Washington. So hopefully that example can kind of show how respectability politics can be used as a weapon as well as um, being used as a form of resistance. And there's very different ways in which it's coming through in terms of HIV AIDS and COVID. Um, with respectability politics with HIV AIDS, what we see is that because HIV is spread through sexual transmission, and because it's also spread through intravenous drug use, there's a lot of discrimination that, and, and stigmatization that circulates the modes of transmission. So the most, which is why even after thousands and thousands of gay white men had passed away by the time of the Ryan White Act, the largest AIDS, federal AIDS legislation is in the name of a young uh, white boy from the Middle West, from the Midwest that was, um, a hemophiliac and it had to be an innocent, a perceived innocent victim. 
when when the when the persons are are seen as folks who were engaging in behavior that brought this on themselves, then they end up being stigmatized as not as not being worthy of the support of people to get them the help that they need. So with COVID, um, I mentioned the idea of consensus issues. It's seen more as a consensus issue because this is something that's impacting everyone and it's all you're doing is breathing. So people don't see this as being a stigmatized um, issue. So there's not really that much respectability politics in terms of modes of transmission, but where we see respectability come back into play is how we see this pathologiz um, pathologization that's happening with vaccine hesitancy. It's also what we see in terms of how mask and social distancing and these I, these concepts were turned into political footballs you know there's no reason that these were you know you know people saying that you're you know you're playing politics by wearing a mask going into a store or people are having violent um responses to people being re requesting them to wear a mask so i see that i think that we see a lot more respectability politics coming into play in those respects with covid Are there any more questions? Did I get all parts of her question? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for this talk and congrats on your professorship. What surprised you most while researching this topic? Mm. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with AIDS and then with I uh, move to COVID. Um, I think for me, one of the most surprising things about my research on the AIDS epidemic was, well, it wasn't so much a surprise, but what I wasn't prepared for is that when you're conducting oral histories and you're talking to people about something as serious as HIV AIDS, you don't, you're not necessarily prepared for, you know, the emotional toll that it's going to take on that person sharing their story with you. And then that may end up having on you yourself. So that was something just as a researcher that I, that kind of caught me. Um, off guard. Um, in terms of COVID, I think what I'm, I'm not really surprised by, but just kind of shaking my head at is the way this vaccine hesitancy conversation is, has become like this dominant um, factor in terms of talking about access to um, people, as, as to why people are under vaccinated. When we've known through every disproportionate health impact in the black and black and brown communities, especially in the African American community, that it always comes back comes back to these socioeconomic, the systemic issues that prevent people from closing these, these socioeconomic gaps. And the ways in which that through each of these epidemics, when we even when we go and we look at disproportionate diabetes, disproportionate, disproportionate cancer rates, disproportionate mortality rates, we just we never seem to want to address what we know is at the basis for these um, communities being disproportionately impacted by these different diseases. And it comes back to these access to housing, access to, um, to I felt like almost a broken record saying my talk sometimes because I feel like I'm constantly just reiterating that it's housing, it's healthcare, it's um, education. And even when I was doing, and one of the other um, surprising elements to me is that multiple HIV AIDS advocates that I interviewed said housing is HIV prevention. And you know, that's really something that stayed with me and it's actually setting me up for my next project when this book project is done, um, is that housing is really one of these critical elements for people having access to healthcare. You know, if you don't have a stable place to live, then you don't have, nine times out of 10, you don't have a primary care doctor you don't have a, a local pharmacy, which means if you do have a condition that requires you to take regular medication, how are you getting it? You know, so. Uh, next, next question from Bri uh, Bryce Yoder. Thank you for this talk. And I am so intrigued by the stark comparisons you draw between HIV AIDS and COVID. Both have been so clearly politicized. In your opinion, what are the most helpful actions that have been done at any level to help break down those stigmas and misconceptions you discuss? Mm. So I think what we've seen, it's really the, it, the grassroots movements that's been working to break down stigmas in terms of HIV AIDS. It is these organizations like Bomb and Gilead, like um, the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS and the faith-based initiatives that they have. So, because 
a lot of even people who are not necessarily religious within the black community black churches have are often these centers for organizing they're the spaces where people go to learn about resources to find out where they can get connected to healthcare to education to different sorts of programs so getting faith leaders on board in a way where they could have these conversations with people without feeling like they were compromising the virtues of their religious beliefs was really a critical component of starting to, to, to get the broader community engaged in these conversations. And also giving um, a space for people to go to find out how to get how to get how to protect themselves and how to get connected to care if they need it. So it's really the, the, the proliferation of the grassroots organizations that help to start. And it's still an ongoing process. There's still a lot of stigma. Um, the one pastor who I showed you the, the um, image of with the sign saying that you know AIDS was God's curse on homosexual, homosexuality, he doubled down. And he did that originally, I want to say in 2004. He doubled down and did it again in 2014. So this is still like an ongoing battle in many spaces to try and break down these stigmas. Uh, but there are a lot of, of people who are recognizing, sometimes it takes people hitting home um, for people to do this, um, but we see big name pastors like T.D. Jakes and these people who are now hosting AIDS conferences for black churches. So we're seeing um, a shift in that movement. Thank you. I have a question from AG. How does respectability politics play a role in issues like gender-based violence, intimate partner violence, as well as the recent massacre of Asian women? Mm. Well, 100%, the, the idea that respectability, that the, the, what respectability does and how it's weaponized is making it okay to mistreat people, right? To say that this group of people, um, for whatever the reason may be, it is all right for them to be left to fend for themselves, or it is all right for you to mistreat them because of whatever reasons. There's really no legitimate reason to ever mistreat, mistreat a group of people, but that's what respectability politics does. It allows you to say like, oh, well, in terms of HIV AIDS, it'll say like, oh, well, you know, these people, like they were engaging in some sort of activity that they, that they shouldn't have. So that's why they got it, that's on them. And which is why I brought up Ray Lewis Thornton and in, in my discussion of my research is because, you know, they put her on the cover of Essence magazine. And the first thing you see in the headlines is that, you know, I was, I'm educated, I'm not promiscuous and, you know, I, and I still, I got AIDS as if somehow being educated and not being promiscuous somehow means that you automatically don't get HIV you know, because you've done the good things and it only comes to bad people. And that's how respectability politics is used to basically say that certain groups don't matter because they are not worthy. It's this idea of, cre of creating an essence of unworthiness across the board. And what we see and I, what we see happening in, in the case of what just happened, this, this most recent massacre, I think we're seeing conversations about the hypersexualization also of a Asian women, which we also see a hypersexualization of Black women that happens as well. And this idea of trying to say that people, you know, because you participate or you work in a certain field or something that you somehow put yourself at a higher risk. And then, you know, creating a victim imagery of the assailant as well is a form of respectability politics. Like, you know, there's been a lot of criticism of the way um, the police officer um, described uh, the assailant in that case saying that, you know, he was having a really bad day and he just snapped. And, you know, how often do you hear a mass murderer um, of any uh, of any sort of uh, black or brown background described as having had a bad day and they snapped? You know, so this is about creating an image of worthiness for some groups and unworthiness for others. Thank you. I have another question from Zhao Kun Liu. Uh, it seems that AAPI communities are also practicing this uh, politics of respectability by trying to in their mind behave like white middle class and shy away from their traditions and what they perceive as negative racial stereotypes. Mm 
of different races. During this COVID, Asian communities are stigmatized. I would like to hear your opinions toward building unity between AAPI, African Americans, and Latinx communities to combat COVID-19 and stigmatization. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think, you know, there's just a lot of, of internal work that definitely has to be done in, in, in terms of bringing that unity. And that's something that I tried to get at towards the end of my talk is us all recognizing that none of us move forward if all of us don't move forward. And that really one of the actions of white supremacy is to create these fractures, right? The idea that, you know, and I think what um, the question was getting at, this is this conceptualization as Asian people as the model minority versus, um, versus black and brown people, which is a division that was created on purpose um, so that we're not coming together. So I think there has to be an acknowledgement um, that a lot of the things that were created to divide us were done with intention. Because if we're all working together for a common goal, for our own betterment, for the working class people to be able to have access to the things that they need to survive, like this $15, um, which is really not even surviving in certain spaces within this country, a $15 minimum wage, you know, once we get people to recognize that we really have a shared collective interest, that is, that's how we do that work. But it's something that requires a lot of of, of looking inward first. And I think that that's gonna be the hard part. Thank you, that concludes the questions. If anyone wants to type something up, please feel free. Yeah, um, actually, Aisha, I would like you to reflect a little bit. Um, it seems that the AIDS epidemic uh, sort of coincided with, you know, a lot of, movements for desegregating the American health system. But at the same time, there is a tremendous closing of African-American, historically Black um, hospitals and medical centers. So by the 1990s, a lot of this infrastructure from the, what you might call the Jim Crow era, mm -hmm. is really, it's just about disappeared, right? And so that um, we just had and just to give you a sense of the context that I'm uh, raising this question, um, Ezell Sanford, a historian, you probably saw his lecture about Homer Phillips and the way it closed and the way people lamented that maybe they had less health care in the wake of the closure of all these um, previously, you know, Black hospitals. And now there's a greater reliance on, you know, predominantly white uh, institution. I'm wondering if um, uh, uh, sort of on the treatment side you know, that, that, you know, the way AIDS was treated might have been affected by this disappearance of historically black hospital. Could you just reflect on that and tell me what you think? I think that definitely the idea that those hospitals not being there, meaning that there's not there. I think also the closing, I think there's a lot of things that impacted that from a historical standpoint, even earlier, the closure of all the black, those black medical schools at, in um, the earlier 1900s, at the idea that there just weren't enough black medical professionals to be in spaces to advocate for saying that, you know, this surveillance is not holistic because that's really what stopped HIV AIDS from being acknowledged in the, the disproportionate impact of HIV and AIDS for being acknowledged in the Black community early on. And it's also, you know, not just the, the doctors, it's also the, the, the healthcare administrators, right? There weren't Black people in these, you know, commissioner roles and these, and working in the Centers for Disease Control at this, at this point. So it's even where there is outreach happening, because it was structured and geared towards gay white men at that moment, there, there just was no reason to suspect it. And even people within the black community weren't suspecting it. And what we see is um, uh, there was Rashida Hassan who was an infectious disease nurse in Philadelphia. And she said that she, she literally quit her job and she started her own nonprofit in Philly for black people with HIV 
because she said she was seeing black people, black and brown people coming into her care. And she's looking at her, her literature from the CDC and she's saying, this says it's not, this, this is predominantly gay white men, but I'm seeing black people coming in here with this disease. And she didn't want to see her community be left behind. So it's literally people seeing it on the ground and then having to go out into the streets and do these grassroots movements. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions for Aisha? Okay. Well, I think that um, we want to say thank you very much for an extraordinary talk. And um, we are looking forward to next week. Hope all of you can join us where we're going to have what we call um, taking stock uh, conversation. Uh, Krishnan and I are going to uh, sort of just moderate a sort of audience driven conversation. And so those of you who have witnessed this series of three lectures, uh, hopefully you will join us. It's going to be an open floor, open forum type uh, conversation where we can try to make sense of what we've learned across these three lectures. So thanks a lot for coming and enjoy your weekend. Thank you all. So um, I, I, okay. Do you guys want me to respond to the, the last thing? There, there was one more question that came in when Professor Choller was talking. Yes, from Karen Gibson. It seems that Asians are being demonized as gays were being demonized during AIDS. Please comment. I do think that um, Asian people, in terms of COVID, um, this idea, this concept of like the Wu flu, and they were definitely being demonized. And this is definitely a way that we, when people, what respectability does is it looks for a scapegoat. It looks for people to say, these are the people who are responsible, instead of saying, let's figure out how to get on top of this. And we saw a lot of this happen um, with the previous administration, instead of creating constructive ways to try and get in front of COVID, instead of telling us in November, in December, you know, you need to start purchasing masks for your homes. You need to make sure you have thermometers and pulse oximeters. You need to start, you know, avoiding um, big mass spaces. Instead, it was like, let's, let's target um, this community say it came from here. And when we really know that a lot of the COVID cases that we received, that we had here in the US early on, because of the shutdown and travel from China to um, the United States, it was coming from European um, countries. But you know, there was a demonization that was happening of, of Asian people in terms of COVID, 100%. And thank you, um, Dr. Trotter, for this opportunity to be here. And thank you all for taking the time to um, come out on a Friday afternoon and listen to um, my thoughts. I really appreciate it. Okay. Krishna, you don't. Do you have anything to say before we close out completely? No, it's just been um, a fascinating listening to uh, Dr. Alicia Scott. Uh, thank you very much, Alicia, for that presentation, and uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Bye -bye. Okay, thank you. So long.